Hey guys. Okay, so in this week's video, we're going to talk about granny flats, aka secondary dwellings, because they are super duper topical at the moment. It feels like every man and his dog out there is talking about the idea of whacking a granny flat in their backyard. More specifically, I want to talk about the five key things that I personally think you need to consider from a town planning perspective before you go down this path. Now, from the start, I'm going to make it clear, today I'm only talking about Brisbane City Council local government area. Each different local government handles their rules and the requirements on this topic slightly different. So yeah, we are only talking about Brisbane here. So what are the five key things? Well, first and foremost, the very first thing I want to say is roughly six, nine months ago, basically towards the end of last year, Brisbane City Council amended the rules for granny flats. So back in the old days, if you want to call it that, you could only have one single household on the property, which then meant one kitchen and one laundry. Under these new rules, these revised rules, which were adapted in response to a housing crisis, you can now have two households on the property, which means you can separately rent out the granny flat, aka secondary dwelling, which in turn then means you can now technically have a second kitchen and a second laundry. Now, this was a game changer for the industry. So that's the first thing to note. Second thing is these structures, whilst they are allowed to be used by separate households, council wants to make sure that they are still ancillary to the primary dwelling. So they are still a smaller component of the property and not a standalone dwelling house. As a result, you still need to keep the GFA, gross floor area, aka internal floor area, less garages, to a maximum of 80 square meters. So you can have verandas and like I just suggested, garages on top of that, but the internal floor area basically needs to be limited to about 80, well not about, to 80 square meters, which essentially is one, sometimes two bedrooms in size. Next thing, you need to make sure that the primary dwelling and the secondary dwelling are no more than 20 metres apart. Now, obviously, most of the inquiries we get for these properties or these types of inquiries come from small lots, lots less than 450 square metres. In that instance, the 20 metres, there is no way you're going to be more than 20 metres. It's just not even a consideration. But when you start to get some of the more rural properties like out at Pullenbell, Gumdale, areas like that, that's where that 20 metre rule actually comes into play. Now, you can technically lodge an application to seek a performance outcome on either the 80 square metre limit or the 20 metre limit. Don't waste your time on the 80 square metre limit, like off the top of my head right here, right now. I can't think of a situation where council would be inclined to support that. Well, actually I can, but it's too complex to explain. So let's just keep it simple and say, don't go there. The 20 metre limit, if you happen to be on, like I suggested, a rural property, and you can argue to council that it's actually a better outcome for them in terms of their assets, their interests, all that sort of stuff to increase the separation distance, then you might have a chance. So I'll give you two examples here. First one, if you say, hey, look, if we position the two structures 20, well, within 20 metres, this new structure, this granny flat, Okay, a secondary dwelling is going to end up within a nice, beautiful, pristine cluster of vegetation. Whereas if we push it 30 metres or 40 metres away, suddenly it's going to land in a nice big cleared area, no impact to vegetation. Naturally, council's going to go, okay, you got our attention, let's talk. <laughs> or likewise, if you say, hey, if we position it within 20 metres, we're going to land in a waterway corridor, which is going to create flooding impacts, biodiversity impacts, all of that sort of stuff. Whereas if we push it a little bit further away, we suddenly avoid all those issues. Naturally, again, council's going to go, yep, you got our attention, let's talk. So yeah, most of the time where these inquiries are coming up, inner city blocks, 20 metre rule, 80 square metre rule, don't bother going down the path of trying to push that rule, or those rules, I should say. There is some exceptions to the rule when you get to the more rural sort of blocks. Okay, so we covered the first point, the second point. The third point I wanted to talk about was the design and siting provisions. So if you have a front lot, which is less than 450 square metres in area, or a rear lot, which is less than 600 square metres, excluding the access handle, then it is defined as a small lot, which means it's accessible against the dwelling house small lot codes. Or code, if I get my words out, I need coffee this morning. Anyway, accessible against that code, which in super simple terms prescribes a minimum rear setback of six metres, unless your block is less than 25 metres in depth, in which case, super simple terms, three metres. Maximum combined building length of 25 metres, so primary dwelling plus secondary dwelling, no more than 25. Generally speaking, maximum site cover of 50%, unless your block's less than 400 square metres, then you can have increased site cover. Uh, minimum side setback of one metre, etc, etc, etc. Now, I'll try to remember to whack a link into the comment section below this video, which takes you to a fact sheet which we, we created, which outlines all of the small lot rules but they are the basic ones. So yeah, a lot of the time people come to us and they're like, oh, but we were planning to get right on the rear boundary. That kind of kills that. 
Yes, so in that situation, you can lodge an application again to seek a performance outcome from council, but the chance of success vary from site to site. It depends on the consistency with the surrounding streetscape, like are you going to stand out like a sore thumb? I had one of these inquiries just a couple of days ago, and I looked at the aerial photo and I was like, oh, it's this beautiful pristine green strip of trees in the backyard of everyone's properties. Yeah. Nah, you are going to stand out like a sore thumb. Council is not going to like that. Whereas if I'd looked at that aerial photo and seen everyone was sort of touching their rear boundary with sheds, pools, all this extra structure or structures, then I'd go, okay, maybe we can talk. Maybe there's something here. So yeah, ideally you comply with the small lot rules so you avoid triggering the need for an application on that aspect or that element. If you want to go down the path of seeking a performance outcome, you need to consider the chance of success. A lot of the time it ain't good. I'll be honest from the very beginning. That's for small lots. If you're a large lot, so again, going back to those numbers, a site, a front lot greater than 450 square meters or a rear lot greater than 600 square meters, excluding the access handle, then you're accessible against the QDC Queensland Development Code, which is legislation that's sort of picked up by the building certifier as part of the, or private certifier, I should say, as part of the building approval process. So go and have a chat to the certifier and find out what their setback rules are. Can you meet them, et cetera, et cetera. Like with town planning, you can lodge an application. In this instance, it's called siting variation to seek a performance outcome or, or an alternate outcome under the QDC. But word on the street is that council has really, really cracked down in that space recently. They're technically not approving anything unless it's just like an Eve overhang encroachment or something like that. So yeah, it's one of those things where you may have done it in the past. It may have been easy in the past. Don't assume it's gonna be easy this time around. Get some up-to-date feedback from the certifier. Okay, this is going to be a long video. So the three points there, we're now going to cover off the fourth point. The fourth point is problematic overlays. So you need to consider, do you have any overlays that are going to restrict the location, the size, all of that sort of stuff of this granny flat? A couple of examples I'll throw at you. Maybe a few. We'll see how many I think of straight away. Firstly, traditional building character loan. Weird and wonderful quirk in the planning scheme, but basically the prescribed accepted development aka exemptions states that extensions or enclosed extensions to the rear of the house are exempt where preceded by lawful demolition work so the question is can you lump in any exempt or not accessible demolition work with the work to make it exempt so i often say to people look if you've got an old crappy watch my language here crappy shed in the backyard or you've got a bit of fencing in the backyard that you can pull down or maybe the rear door to the house can come down so we can say it's associated with that to trigger the exemption to allow you to avoid town planning application so you've got to look at that side of things like you flooding you're going to be most likely over the 25 square meter exemption so you're going to trigger assessment against the flood overlay code does that mean you need to be potentially 2.5 meters off the ground depends or have you got things like slt significant landscape tree overlay which suddenly means you can't build within a certain area like there's a heap of different problematic overlays you need to work through to make sure that they're not going to restrict where you can do or trigger applications or any of that sort of stuff okay that's the fourth one fifth one what was my fifth neighborhood plans had to think about for a second there you need to make sure again there's no neighborhood plans that like the overlays are going to trip you up and the example i'll give you west end woolongabba district neighborhood plan sub precinct npp001 that neighborhood plan basically says no secondary dwellings you can't do them here now, technically, you only trigger that criterion if you trigger an application. So, like, if you're not triggering an application for other reasons, then that neighborhood plan won't come into play. It gets messy, it gets complicated, but the point I'm trying to make here is you need to consider your neighborhood plans. Okay, so let's just recap. Firstly, the use requirements have changed. You can now have two households. Next, you're still limited to the 80 square meter, 20 meter rule. Then you've got to consider your design and siting requirements, whether it's the small lot rules or the QDC rules. Then you need to consider the problematic overlays. And then last but not least is the neighborhood plans. Now, they are only the key town planning things. And there is a bucket load of other stuff out there you need to consider. Like we haven't even talked about tax implications in terms of income tax or capital gains tax, insurance implications. Will your insurer cover you if something happens there, etc., etc. There is a whole world of other issues you need to work through before you go down this path. But that's not my area of expertise. My area is town planning. So we are focusing on town planning today. I think that covers off everything I want to talk about today. As I always say, until next time, thanks for watching. For all you red tape lovers out there, I have one thing to say. Well, no, actually, I've got three. Number one, the advice provided in these videos is general in nature. It's not site specific. You would be a silly billy to go and make financial decisions based on this advice without first checking with the town planner. Don't be a silly billy. Number two, Brisbane Town Planning is in no way linked to Brisbane City Council. The views expressed in these videos are my own, not council's. So if you don't like them, blame me, not council. 
Number three, what was my number three? Oh yeah, the views expressed in these videos are accurate at the time of recording. If you're watching this video back 10 years from now, the views may not be so accurate. That's all.